Well, a very warm welcome to this Living Values webinar. Uh, this is one of a series. I think we've been going in 21 and 20. So we do them uh, as much as often, uh, once a month. And uh, we welcome people live. But we're very aware that many, many people watch these uh, webinars now um, remotely. They are on the Living Values um, a live website and you can go to that website and you can click on any of our webinars uh, to uh, look at the, the ones that have already gone before. Um, we're very pleased worldwide by the way these webinars are being received and I think it's because of the quality of, of, of uh, the presentations, which have been really superb. We've had such a range of speakers and topics and a lot of food for thought, all about values and how we should be caring for ourselves, others and the planet. And thinking about the planet is where we Think of David, our speaker this, uh, today, David F Fletcher. Uh, David uh, told us before we started recording that he's speaking from Nova Scotia. And it's a very warm, balmy day there at 27 degrees below freezing or something like that. Um, he'll tell us more in a moment. Uh, but David, we're very pleased to welcome you. Um, you are someone who is known for your uh, dare I say, pioneering work in things like biodiversity. Um, when we think in values terms about caring for the planet, folks such as you are really spearheading our thinking and uh, making us realize that we have to care even more for our planet. I always remember a number of years ago, there was a, a conference in Iceland uh, and the president of Iceland at that time held a reception. And it was a long time before climate change was really on the radar. And he showed us a map and the map showed how the polar ice cap was melting at an alarming rate. And he said, the world must wake up, be much more aware of this. And luckily, perhaps, I hope not too late, but luckily, um, people have woken up to this and uh, we now are trying to do things about it individually and as nations. But David, welcome. You have an, uh, uh, an experience in informal uh, community education training uh, and, uh, and you said mainly in Africa, which is fascinating. I think Helen has an association with you regarding Africa. And you've been teaching at uh, graduate university level, um, uh, but not particularly in the school settings. So you've been educating uh, older adolescents and adults, I believe. So thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for this topic of growing the values of biodiversity. Um, I, for one, am on the edge of my seat, quite literally, waiting to hear your talk. So without any more ado, may I hand over uh, to David. Welcome, David. Great, thank you, Neil, very much. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm not going to talk about the weather because I'm <laughs> pretending that I'm on the African continent somewhere and it's nice and warm and the sun is shining. So uh, I'll just uh, jump right into the presentation. Uh, and I have a little... Um, PowerPoint here that I'm going to share. Uh, but please, at any time, we're a small group. Uh, just speak up or, or raise your hand. I'll try to keep my eyes uh, checking if you have a question or want something clarified, or if I'm going on too long or not saying enough about some of the stories. Uh, but it's a great pleasure for me to uh, have a chance to talk about the values of biodiversity to a group of people that uh, have chosen to spend a lot of their, their uh, professional lives and I think personal lives as well, looking at and nurturing values. So I'm very happy to uh, be presenting to this group um, on some of the things that I'm, I'm learning. I continue to learn um, from natural systems. 
Um, and, um, you know, thinking about the values in those natural systems, as we learn from them, is it something intrinsic, something about the systems themselves that are showing us these values? Or are we really just using them as a, as a metaphor? So maybe that's something we can talk about afterwards. And I'd like to start, if I can, um, with a little video clip. Um, this is something I have seen many times before. And maybe many of you have seen, because I noticed it's got 43 million views on YouTube. But uh, I think it's, it's really helpful in terms of bringing some of the environment, bringing nature into, uh, into our space together today. Uh, just four minutes. So here we go. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, 
but also its physical geography. Had anyone seen that video clip before? So I just, I've seen it many times, but I just love it. I couldn't help myself today from not, uh, not sharing it. And I just wanted to hear maybe, yeah, thumbs up. Um, maybe from two or three of you, any particular values you were reminded of by seeing that video clip? Anyone like to share? Any values that came to mind? No right answers, no wrong answers. Sue? I'll share, David. Um, it jogged my memory, actually. I used to belong to an organization called WOLF, um, mm -hmm. which was a female leadership program as the European director. Well, the one thing about, and it wasn't covered in this clip, but one thing about wolves, it's very much the one of the few um, a few species that will actually invite a stranger into their pack. Hmm. So they're really, we used to use it for in, uh, inclusion and diversity. It's the, about the only natural animal, if you like, um, that would do that. Lovely. So it reminded yeah. me of that, actually. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything you remind of? Christine? And you need to unmute, Christine. Sorry. Um, it reminded me of the value of cooperation, although it didn't seem to be negotiated as such. But the, the, the well-being of all the creatures seemed to be enhanced by the, the actions that seemed contrary to the good things for you know, with killing, you, mm -hmm. you would associate killing as a destructive force, but it seemed like from this destructive potential could come really wonderful regrowth, regeneration of forests, etc. All the birds coming back, and yeah, and every every creature that benefited, like the rabbit or whatever else, they were their lives were enhanced by the cooperative. Well, I don't, I don't know whether that's an appropriate use of a map. Yeah, yeah. Ruth, I saw your hand and then Neil. I was reminded of the, the quality of the mother nature and how the mother accommodates everything. And so it was almost like she embraced the wolves and everything adjusted. Mm -hmm. So that there was a good outcome for everything. Um, yeah, okay. System yeah. kind of balanced itself out it. in a different it's way. Beautiful. Nice. It's a, a sort of a flow, a sort of a freedom. Um, and I also picked up on cooperation, but I just thought how beautiful. But I was taken by the beauty of the cinematography as well. Mm. The voice, the enthusiasm of the presenter. It was a masterpiece. And so I was moved on a few levels there. Great. Thank you for showing that. I hadn't seen it before. Uh -huh. And Neil, for you? Well, I, I agree with everything Ruth has said, too. It was the most marvellous uh, uh, video. I hadn't seen it before, wish I had. Uh, but it really showed for me sustainability in action. Uh, if we're going to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Goals, we've got to put values into action. And uh, this film showed how humans can actually, with a lot of wisdom, another value, uh, 
really start to have a positive effect on the environment. Um, you know, it was counter thinking in many ways, wasn't it? Most people would think, oh, wolves will do so much harm, keep them out. Mm -hmm. I know in Scotland they were discussing whether to reintroduce wolves in certain areas and the sheep farmers were up in arms and everything because, oh, it's going to destroy so much. How can we control them? Uh, but this is a good lesson for us, I think. Um, so thank you. So sustainability for me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to uh, move on. Uh, Helen, I saw your hand, but maybe we can get a comment from you uh, a little bit later yeah, on this no clip or, or other things that we, uh, we have a look at. Because I have a, a few stories uh, I would like to, uh, to tell as we uh, go through today. Um, and one of them is concerning bees. Uh, we all know about bees as, as pollinators. They say 35% of crops, you know, benefit from the pollination of bees. Um, and 75% of fruit trees and um, uh, nut trees, etc. 75% need bees as pollinators. And bees are one of the insects that are, you probably heard stories, are nearing extinction. You know, they talk about 40% of insects are on that endangered species list. And bees, they provide so much in terms of food production, the micronutrients within foods, maintain functioning of ecosystems. Um, so there's something, you know, we very much need within our environment. And often when people think about bees, they talk about, you know, how hardworking they are. They talk about cooperation, um, the unique roles that the different kinds of bees might play in the hive and their sense of belonging to that hive and being part of you know, under one queen bee, there's all these different kinds of bees, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to share another story that, that for me is really significant in, in thinking about bees and the values of bees. And it was with a friend of mine named Fikre when I was living and working in Ethiopia and we were out for lunch somewhere and there was all kinds of bees flying around and one of them, and we were kind of shooing them off, but they were still there. And one bee flew up to my Coke bottle and went in the Coke bottle. And I quickly picked up the cap and put it on top and kind of smiled to myself. Look at that, I captured one of the bees. And Fikre reached across the table and took the cap off the bottle and said, born free, live free. And that story has stuck with me for the last, it's probably been 25 years now, in terms of the, the great respect we need to have for other living beings and sort of the, the sanctity of life, the sacredness of life, you know, everything Every living being has a unique part to play, and we need to allow them to play those parts. And just for us to be a little distracted or feel harassed by bees around when we're having lunch is our problem. They're doing what they're meant to do. So that's one little story that's uh, really stuck with me around, uh, around the idea of, of bees. Um, Whoops. So they're, they're pollinators, uh, but we can learn from them about respect and about sacredness. Um, for me, me uh, another little story is captured in uh, this image. Uh, and some of you may know of um, the book that was written, I think it was 2015 or something. Uh, by Peter Wallenben called The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel and How They Communicate. 
And this was quite an a influential book because as a, as a forester, as a scientist, uh, this Peter and many others have now done research that demonstrates that trees actually experience pain. They have memories. They, uh, they live with their children. And they're very much social beings. They share nutrients. If one, if one tree has been damaged and is sick, they can trace through the, the fungi of the roots that a healthy tree will send nutrients to help heal and the, the damaged tree to grow again. Um, so it's been quite cutting edge research from a ecology standpoint in terms of the social nature of trees and forests and how we have to think about managing and maintaining and celebrating forests and not individual trees for their, their economic value. Um, so a lot of work away from plantation forestry and this sense of you can't just cut down a tree. It's a part, it's a part of a community. But this particular image I also liked uh, because you know the sense of the, the roots shaking hands with each other under the tree. Um, but some people might complain that this is, you know, a sense of, of anthropomorphizing, you know, applying human traits or characteristics to these trees who many would say are not conscious beings. But I think it's very interesting, you know, if, if there's demonstrated proof of how they care and support each other, maybe their form of consciousness is better than maybe the form of consciousness we have as human beings, where we make so many bad choices <laughs> as individuals and as societies. And when you look at the state of the world today, and you think about climate change and violence and domestic violence, and it goes on and on and on, what is the real value of the so-called consciousness that makes us a higher being than other living things. It, it really has to be questioned in some ways. And um, there's a, a Dagara elder um, by the name of Maladoma Somme from Burkina Faso. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He just passed away this past December. And he talked about three kinds of um, of living beings in the world, the plant world, the animal world, and the human world. And he said the plant world is the most evolved because they're content and they're silent. And they just stay where they are and do what they're supposed to do. And animals are, are a little bit lower, but the next on the scale, because they speak a little bit and they move around a little bit, but they're pretty happy in what their role is and what they're supposed to do as, as part of the ecosystem, as part of creation. But human beings are the lowest on the scale because we're always running around trying to do different things. We're always talking, we're always speaking, we're always verbalizing things, and we're always trying to prove our worth. So from a, a Dagara Cosmovision perspective, it's plants and then animals and then humans that really have to make the effort to evolve their consciousness. So for me, that's another um, really, really striking story. Um, you know, to understand the social nature of plants and to really value interconnectedness and that sense of, of caring. Um, another story from uh, the, the African continent where I've been um, very blessed to spend a good part of my, the last 35 years of, of my career um, and was able to do some work on um, baobab 
which you might have heard in a lot of the health food stores now has baobab. It's the newest super food. Um, very high in vitamin C, vitamin B6, fiber, antioxidants. It's, it's an amazing thing. But anyone that's spent time, particularly in West Africa or Savannah regions, would know it's a very iconic tree. You know, they're, they're scattered across the savanna here and there. They can grow very, very large. They say some of them can live to be 2,000 years old, um, these baobab trees. And they have very hard, tiny seeds. So it's, it's difficult to grow them, to propagate them. And um, it, it's, it's, there's many fewer of them around now than they used to be, even though they found they, uh, they have this superfood. But what's interesting is elephants eat the entire pod of the baobab tree. And they have a special enzyme in their stomach that's not found anywhere else that helps to break down the hard shell of those seeds. And then when elephants defecate, the seeds come out and they very quickly germinate in this nutrient rich environment where they have been planted on the ground. And, you know, when you look across uh, uh, the savanna and you see these scattered baobab trees, that's probably the path that elephants have, pass, have passed in, in previous times. So, you know, a lot of the research around the, the, the superfood nature of the baobab even talks about the value of baobab as a, a weaning food for children because it's so rich. Uh, that it's a good food to eat in the lean system, lean season when uh, other foods are not available. Um, but culturally, it's also talked about as a sacred food for the Dagara people, where I've had the pleasure to do quite a bit of, of research over the years. They talk about it as the food you serve to the ancestors. And the food for angels comes from the baobab tree. So they give great gratitude to these majestic trees that are in their, in their environment. And when I hear about all of these things, for me, it's just, there's something, something magical about the interdependence of the, the trees and the elephants and the food for humans, et cetera, et cetera. And that for me represents the value that we see within the, the biodiversity of nature, but maybe it's something we can learn about as, as human beings as well. Um, from the, the savanna areas of um, West Africa, uh, I, whoops, I'd like us, uh, Maybe now to come to Nova Scotia, uh, Mi'kma'ki, the land of the, the Mi'kmaq people, the indigenous people of this part of the world, who latest uh, archeological research has said they've been living here for 14,000 years. Um, and one of the things I've, I've learned from my interaction with, with elders like Kerry Prosper is that Human beings all live within nature. We're, we're part of nature. We would not be able to exist without nature. So we have to learn how to live in harmony with nature. Um, and, and Carrie and others talk about, it's not just biodiversity, but it's biocultural diversity that we have to be thinking about in the the 21st century. Um, and there's lots of ecologists that have been talking about this for, um, for generations now. You know, Vandana Shiva in the early 90s wrote Monocultures of the Mind and the difficulties of just focusing on, on one particular crop agriculturally because how vulnerable that makes us 
but also one particular way of being in our minds can make us very vulnerable as well. So some people are doing work around developing what's called biocultural community protocols. What's the kind of relationship we want to have with our environment and other living beings in the environment? And I've learned a lot from, from elders like Carrie Prosper and Albert Marshall, Clifford Paul, others who, who I just want to name today to to honor the wisdom they have gathered from their elders and their ancestors and, and passed down. And, and one of the, the life ways or, or ways of being that the Mi'kmaq people talk about is nadoglamek. Nadoglamek. And it's that in your interactions with nature, you only harvest as much as will keep away not having enough. So interesting translation, it's not you harvest for abundance or you harvest as much as you want or even you harvest as much as you need, but you only harvest enough so that you won't be lacking, so that you won't not have enough and you and your family will suffer. So it's not about acquiring things, it's about surviving, but surviving in a very harmonious way. And it's, it's become a, a really powerful concept in terms of conservation and how people think about conservation. And um, the Mi'kmaq community is now very involved in uh, conservation of fisheries and the moose population and, and many other things using this particular approach. But also, um, Kerry is a, a spiritual leader in his community. And he's taught me that every time you finish a prayer, you say, Ntogoma. Ntogoma. And the translation of Ntogoma is all my relations. And it's not a sense of all my relations as David Fletcher, but my relations with all other living beings on the planet. That when you end a prayer and you're asking for healing or you're asking for good health or good wishes, it's always ended with all my relations that you want to send that prayer out to all living beings, which includes the plants and the animals, and even the, the stones that are talked about as elders in, in Mi'kmaq cosmology. So again, something very positive and powerful, I think, from, from the environment, from nature, from biodiversity, and how humans can interact with that in a very different way, perhaps, than what's been done in the past. Um, a couple more stories. Um, and this, this slide I've put up to, to represent African women farmers. Uh, because there's something special, I think, about the, the responsibility that, that African women have taken to uh, maintain and revitalize um, the, the food chain uh, on the African continent. And, and presently, a lot of what's happening in some of the areas I've been working in is they're trying to revitalize the variety, the diversity of traditional grains and legumes or pulses. Because it's become clear to them that there are different soil conditions, different water requirements, different growing seasons, give different nutritional benefits. And traditionally they had all of these different grains and legumes that they could use to, to feed themselves and their families. And over the last 
50, it's in some places it's only been 50 or 80 years. There's been this, um, you know, strong movement towards grow maize, grow as much as you can to feed your family and sell the rest to get some cash in your pocket. And a lot of the traditional um, uh, varieties of of grains, sorghums, etc., millets and pulses have been lost. And now people are saying, with climate change, we're not going to get the same kind of production from our maize, and uh, there isn't a market to sell it much anymore anyway. So let's let's grow something for um, Jatropha, for um, uh, energy substitute. For, it's just really taken the, the ownership of the growing of food out of the hands of women uh, into the hands of an industrial economy. And um, people are not able to food, feed nutritious food to their families anymore. Uh, there's also a story in the, the Fra Fra area of Northern Ghana uh, that uh, Prof uh, Apusiga, uh, a colleague of mine has done some work on, that talks about tulum. Tulum is a, a bitter soup. And when you taste it, it's quite bitter. But when it gets to the back of your tongue, there's a real richness and a real sweetness to it. And it's highly nutritious. And um, uh, Apusiga uses this as a as an example to talk about the great endurance that women have to work through the challenges, the, the harsh realities of life, and realize if they make that effort, like in giving birth, there's great, great sweetness and richness that comes afterwards. So there's this, this whole way of thinking with um, I think rural African farmers, women farmers, and seed protectors. I, I remember an experience with Sumeru women in Kenya, where it was a real celebration of seeds and the different varieties of traditional seeds, but a real sense of they have a responsibility to protect those seeds for future generations. You know, people talk about this as intergenerational equity. And in a sense of diversity, you need to protect those seeds so that people can survive and thrive in the, in the future. Um, and you know, anyone who's, who's a gardener or a farmer and works with seeds, faith is a very, very important value to have because you need to have the faith that when you plant that seed, it's going to grow. Um, so, you know, the, the effort that it takes, but also the faith to be, be successful uh, in a farm situation. And my last story um, is from uh, an elder, um, uh, indigenous elder, uh, a Nashanabek woman uh, in Canada by the name of Josephine Mandemin, who works with water as a water protector. And this woman, she passed, I, I think now in 2019, but between 2003 and 2017, she walked 17,000 kilometers around the shoreline of the Great Lakes. You know, these are the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. But, but for her, she felt she had been given the responsibility as an Anishabak woman to protect the water. That was a traditional role for women, to protect the water because it's, it's one of the things that gives life to all living things, to all human beings. And we should never pollute or destroy the water or misuse the water. And sometimes scientists talk about, you know, in very technical language, they talk about 
ecosystem services, that the ecosystem service provides water and oxygen and energy and you need pest control and you need water treatment and you get the benefits and you maintain them and waste comes out the other end. And, but, but the whole cosmovision of, of Anishinaabeg people is, you know, we, we need water for life. Water is part of our life. We are made of water. And how do we write the relationship we have with water? How do we show gratitude for the water? How do we show, you know, the hope? How do we, we follow up on the hope that water gives us? What's our, our reciprocal relationship with water and our responsibility for water? And uh, Grandma Josephine has inspired many, many people, uh, including a, a Mi'kmaq elder, Doreen Bernard, who I've had the great honor to uh, walk with on water walks in uh, the Nova Scotia area in the past. And as you walk along and, you know, a spring, she might walk five or 600 kilometers. Every body of water, every stream, every lake, when you see the ocean, when you see a puddle of water on the road, as you take this sacred walk, you offer thanks and you offer tobacco to every body of water you see around the way. And for me, it was really, really powerful in terms of, you know, changing consciousness, changing the way we think about our relationship with water. Um, and both Josephine and Doreen, I mean, they were really strong activists, you know, they would, they would march in the streets and talk about don't pollute our water, it should be environmentally uh, protected. You know, they talked about different creating alternatives for for how the water can be used. But Doreen said to me, you know, all of that advocacy work I do is nothing compared to the prayers of gratitude I give when I do the water walks, that that's the most important work I feel I'm doing. And for me, that really, you know, touched my heart and, and touched my consciousness in terms of this relationship with water. Um, so I feel very blessed that I've had these, um, these experiences and um, been able to, uh, to learn from nature and the biodiversity of, of nature in these, these various ways. And I've got a, a couple of other things I'd, I'd like to share, but I'd just like to um, ask you in terms of, of these stories, and maybe just think to yourself for a couple of minutes, what has spoken to you from these particular stories that I've told? What, what has specifically touched your heart and mind? Because uh, I think there's, there's powerful lessons we can learn from from the natural world. So I'll just take a minute and let you think about that. And then what I wanted to do was just share another slide in terms of the connections between these different stories. And I know if we took the time, we would look at the connections between seeds and trees and elephants and, and the idea of life ways where you only take enough and their relationship to bees and to water, et cetera. And I think this is important because, you know, the in a system, the sum is, is greater than the parts. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think it works the same way when we, when we nourish some of these particular values, they're all interconnected and they can um, help us learn and understand and be able to follow 
some of these values and bring them in and make them make them real in our lives. Um, but one of the things that I've found in my work is that, that we can assume that people like these values. Yeah, gratitude's a good thing. Faith is a good thing. Conservation is a good thing. But how do we actually make people accountable for these values? And I had a couple of other slides um, around accountability, uh, but I see we only have a few minutes left. So I'm just gonna skip over these. Uh, this was developed with a colleague of mine, Eloise Burke, who does a lot of organizational development work. In terms of understand the values is one thing, but how do people, how do you keep people accountable for celebrating situations where the value has been followed or addressing people or situations where the value has not been followed? Uh, and this is from sort of a, a organizational perspective, but, but from a more individual perspective, um, I've been thinking a lot about you know, how do, we, how do we value each value? How do we become accountable to ourselves and check ourselves? That we're not just talking about these values, but are actually bringing them into and using them in our lives. And I've done different things with this over the years, but uh, in a conversation with uh, a colleague of mine, Debbie Castle, just a couple of days ago, preparing for this webinar, we started thinking that, you know, um, we, need to, we need to be valuing each value. We need to make it visible, uh, acknowledge, name where it comes from so we understand it, but then really explore what it means. You know, what's the impact when that value is present or not present? And deeply comprehend the meaning of the value so we can integrate it for ourselves and then hopefully apply it in our lives and hopefully apply it consistently and at the right time and at the right place so we can, we can celebrate it, we can glorify it. So this is kind of a, a virtual cycle that I'd love to uh, chat with people about and get some other feedback. Uh, maybe that's for another time because I want a few minutes for questions and I wanted to end with a gift, if I may. So I'd ask everyone to pick a letter, A, B, C, D, and we have a little gift of nature's wisdom for you. Um, so has everybody picked a letter? I see some nods. So if you picked D, a message from a hummingbird. Embrace what makes you happy. Be joyful. Count your blessings. And open yourself to pleasure. If you chose E, you're a beaver. As a Canadian, I had to put beaver up on this. Um, the value, the blessing, make today count. Build towards manifesting your dreams. And if you picked B, the sugar maple tree. Introduce versatility in your life. Stand out as a unique individual. Change is sweet. And if you happen to choose A, I don't know if we all chose the same one or we all chose a different one. But if you choose, chose A, it's a message from the silver birch. Cleanse your body and spirit to find peace and health. And meditate with me. They say uh, a grove of birch trees is one of the best places to, to meditate. It's the wisdom of the indigenous people of, of this land. And if you chose C, it's a message from the bear. Go within. Strength comes from inner knowing. 
So um, maybe maybe I rush through things too fast. You can tell from my intoxication that I love the the wisdom of nature, but I'll um, I'll leave it there and would love to have a a few minutes of of question and discussion and uh, uh, yeah. Hope, hope we can begin that relationship together. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, um, very, I don't think very often I'm speechless, but I'm, <laughs> I'm quite speechless because I've been so touched at my very heart and roots by what you've been saying. And I'm sure others will wish to comment or ask you a question. So may I immediately ask others, uh, just pitch in, do, do, do comment at this stage or ask a question. Helen, yes, please. Hi, well, yeah, I would echo what um, Neil just said. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful, David. Um, and uh, a couple of the values that you asked us to reflect on at the beginning um, came up to me. And one was the humility to change our ideas. I mean, you, I think you've challenged us to very much to change our way of thinking and with such incredible examples like um, the role of the wolves um, mm -hmm. that we must see in a very different way and have the humility to recognize that nature has a deeper wisdom than perhaps we have. Um, and then the discernment, I don't know if it's a, a value, but it's connected to a number of values, you know, to, to discern our priorities now in the world. And, and that was beautifully illustrated by the, the African lady who now realizes that you can't just go for monoculture maize and, and we have to now look at the um, the original local plants that we've used and with great success in the past and um and in living values we uh, the methodology that we use to help people to deeply appreciate values is can be summarized in three words explore experience and express and, and i think it's this word experience you use the word integrate which I, I think touches on that, but I, I think this uh, is at the depth of the question that you brought out, you know, how to help people recognize their responsibility and to value values. I think it has to come from an experience, otherwise it does remain as just philosophy and, and words. And it's only when one feels that deep love and respect for nature and that intoxication that you talked about, that we're ever going to want to change our ways and really do something about it. So uh, thank you again, David, for, and especially for bringing in all the different cultures and the ancient wisdom, the ancestral knowledge. I mean, that really mm. touched me very deeply. Great, thank you. Yes, I agree with what you were saying, Helen. And also I was thinking, you know, how do we know when we're stepping over those values? And of course, one of the things that we recognize is the pain. We cause ourselves pain and we cause pain to, you know, nature, animals and everything. So it's like overstepping the values. The indication is like pain. So lovely to see you all. Thank you. Lovely to see you, Maureen, after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded of the beauty and the power of storytelling. And I think this is a way to um, open people's hearts with real experience. Mm -hmm. As uh, Helen was saying about experience and to give an experience through a story is very powerful. And I was reminded with the North American um, elders that you mentioned of an article that really opened my heart many years ago before even living values. It was a National Geographic um, piece on the Maka people of the uh, Vancouver Island area, and they were whalers and how uh, they would go out. Um, they would kill one whale, just what they needed. 
and they'd use every bit of it. Nothing was wasted. Mm -hmm. And they would sing to the whale to make it peaceful so that its death was painless and the, the males, um, it, was, it was the males that went out in the, in the canoes. But so everything was done as peacefully, as respectfully as possible. And this interconnectedness between the, the women and the whale and the, the boats they used and everything, it was, um, it was lovely. So thank you, David. Lovely, thank you. And Anne, did I see you wanted to share something? You can unmute or someone else. No, I don't think I'm dead. <laughs> I did, there you are. Well, the thing I liked about was that the trees, the interconnectedness of the trees and how they have such compassion for each other and how they cooperate mm -hmm. and the sensitivity of the trees through their roots. Uh, that really touched me very much. Yeah, if, if you can get your hands on that book, it's a fascinating book, very well written. And it's science that's been developed just in the last 20, 25 years. And at the end of my PowerPoint that I'm, I'm happy to share with people, I have some of the references for the, the books. Yeah, good, good. It's a good yeah. read. Yeah, The Hidden Life of Trees. Thanks. Yeah, I, I feel that uh, your presentation, you know, it's just so important and I wish everyone could see it because it it kind of uh, gives the opportunity of a, a sort of a, a paradigm shift. You know, just simple things like not killing bee, you know, not just killing bees or taking things for granted like water. Those I think those are key for people to change their relationship to nature and to start to make different choices. Mm -hmm. Just understanding these simple, sacred, po potential sacred uh, relationships that we can have that have got so, so lost over so many years. And, you know, I've seen my own consciousness changing like dramatically over the last 10 years or so. And it just keeps increasing, increasing, uh, particularly listening to more and more stories like, a, like you've uh, told tonight. So, yeah, I just feel it, this work is so important just at this moment when people really need, well, just like a firework <laughs> under mm. their, you know, whatever, <laughs> to, uh, to start to make changes. <laughs> Great. It's somehow, David, you, you, you take away the veil of ignorance from us. And as you were speaking, I thought I want I would love this webinar now to go into every every school so that children can just grasp it. As Ruth was saying, the power of story really fires the imagination and it's rooted in, in your incredible experience uh, with so much profound thinking. Um, you yeah. are able to encapsulate it um, so simply. Um, Anne, would you mute yourself, please, a moment? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you. You express it so simply, but so profoundly. And I think young children, older children, us all, can grasp what you've been saying. I, I, I have rarely heard a speaker that has been able to sort of touch us at so many levels uh, all at once. You, you fired me up for, for one uh, mm. to, to want to, to, to put things more into practice. I'm always talking about these subjects, but your very lovely, neat model, uh, um, you know, I'm going to, may I pinch that and, and use it? Uh, because I think it's so important, as were all your slides. I, I'm just looking forward to watching this again when Joe sends the recording <laughs> out. And it linked, Joe, very much to how you were introducing this thinking a few months ago. So acknowledging your wonderful presentation, too. 
I'm now conscious that we're past time and I'm always keen to keep to our time. So may I round up by again thanking you, David, from the bottom of my heart, and I know everyone else's, for, for uh, an absolutely stimulating hour, which has made us all, you know, even do, to do more, to... to and I think also... The world. I think also all those farmers and indigenous people and, and women, you know, at the grassroots that have kept this simple wisdom for generations, but it's so powerful and so, so needed for this time. That's where our real thanks needs to go. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, indeed. So thank you all so much. Uh, for coming. And those of you who are listening uh, after our presentation today, uh, I'm sure David would welcome uh, messages from you or um, he's offered to share thinking and, and resources. So thank you, David. And may we wish you well in Nova Scotia. And are you going back to Africa again or have you left Africa now to, to remain in Nova Scotia? The, the first time I can get on a plane, I will be going. COVID has slowed things down a little bit, but yeah, I'm, the bag is packed. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for coming. And uh, thank you. A big, big thank you to David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.